Alright, let's take a look at how we can uh, find Zero Force members by inspection, doing them real quickly. Right? Let's uh, go back and remember rule of thumb number one. If we have three forces at the joint, two of them are collinear, but the third is not, then the third will be zero. Or the other rule of thumb that we have is if two forces only are at the joint, then both must be zero. So let's take a look at what we've got here. We've got a um, a joint H here that has a reaction and then three forces, so a total of three, but none of them are collinear, so the rot doesn't apply there. We come over to I, I got one, two, three, four, five forces, so no go there. J, one, two, three, four, five, nothing there. K, one, two, three, four, five, nothing there. L, one, two, three, but not collinear, so nothing directly associated with the bottom chord. Right? If we go to the joint D, notice we have one, two, three, but two of them are collinear, that means that this third must be zero. So even though it comes down to here, where we have lots of members coming in by joint D, DI must be zero. Likewise, when we look at joint E, another T-type joint, the third one must be zero. And look at this, that leaves us down here at joint I, ultimately, that AI is the stem of this inverted T, it must now also be zero, but you can only get there by first figuring out DI is zero, then figuring out that EI equals zero, and then you can conclude that AI is zero. Some of you will still rebel against that because you'll say, but AI is connected to a joint where there's an applied load. So what? Joint I tells us that AI must be zero. It can't be one value at one end of the member and another value at the other. If that was the case, this is how we'd send rockets to the moon. Build a little truss, put a little load on there, and kabwammo, we'd have instant acceleration. Doesn't work that way, right? But it's a good question to go back and say, well, then how does this structure resist these loads? Well, you still have one, two, three non-zero potentially force or members here at joint A to help support the effect of uh, the supplied load P. So we're, we're actually still okay there. Then you say, well, if that's the case over here, don't we have something similar over here? And you betcha we do. Go to joint F and you then prove that FK equals zero. Go to joint G and GK will be zero. Then you can go to K and that makes CK equal to zero. And A, one more here, because look at this big T joint up here at, at uh, B, then we've got a T joint and therefore BJ is also zero. Now, after going through all this, if you're saying, well, I get the pattern matching, but I don't understand why, go to T3.1 where we prove these rule of thumbs, number one and number two, and you need to be able to not only identify these this quickly, but also be able to go and prove why these values are the way they are. Right? Now, before we go, I'm gonna, I want to do one thing here. Now, if we've got zero force members, then in a sense, we could remove them, and we still have a stable structure. Let's see if that were the case. Now, when I say remove them, I have to be a little bit careful. For instance, right here, CGL, I have to turn into a single solid member. I can't just um, leave that joint. I can't pull out GK because it provides a little stability for that joint otherwise. And that's one of the reasons why you have members that are otherwise zero. They serve stability purposes. They also can provide for the support of loads in a different loading scenario for that particular structure. Okay, so here's what our truss then ended up looking like after we remove and then we fix the joints where we took away members. And this is certainly a stable truss and can handle that load. So uh, we're okay in that regard.